Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, for this exciting webinar about lean principles and practices in the office. Uh, I'm Ari Santiago, President, CEO of IT Direct, and a host of the Made in America podcast. And I am so happy today to be with uh, Mateen Karbasian, who's a lean practitioner at Constep, a uh, lean practitioner extraordinaire, if I could say. Uh, and I'm really, really excited. I think lean has been in the in the zeitgeist in manufacturing for quite some time and really in my mind too focused on just the manufacturing floor there's so much opportunity uh, in the office outside of manufacturing and of course within offices in manufacturing to apply lean principles um, i'm really pumped it's something that i'm very very passionate about in part because technology is a huge help in doing it uh, and so something i've thought about and in, in for a long long time and most importantly because mateen's got such a great grasp of the lean concepts, such a great grasp of how to implement it uh, in all areas. And I think it's gonna be a great job educating us on where we could find value here and how to get started. So uh, before we get into the thing in about five seconds here, just some technology reminders, the audience is on mute. Um, so if you want to uh, get a question, please use the Q&A or the questions pop out in your GoToWebinar panel. So you should have, when you signed in, you'll get a little panel that pops up and there's a questions pan, uh, mode in there. Go ahead and open that up. And at any point throughout the uh, presentation, feel free to throw a question there. Uh, if we can answer it midway, we will. Uh, if it doesn't fit or we miss it, uh, we will at the end go through some Q&A and you can ask any additional questions then. Our goal today is really to educate and deliver value to the audience. Your questions will help us do that. So without further ado, Mateen, you're up. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, Ari for uh, having me uh, on this uh, program. I think, uh, as he mentioned, we see a lot of opportunities when it comes to lean, not only in manufacturing, not only on the factory floor, but also uh, uh, lots of opportunities in the office environment within information flow. Uh, as we get started, as, as it's, it's been my habit, uh, I always like to start things off with, a, with an icebreaker, although we're using um, a go to meeting today. Uh, for the past uh, couple of months, uh, I've gotten better at uh, using uh, Zoom quite a bit to communicate with our clients and uh, run training sessions and so on. Uh, I was born in 1961, so that pretty much makes me a baby Zoomer. Uh, I came up with that a couple of days ago. Uh, I'm going to see if I can sell it to anybody, but uh, from the uh, audience's reaction, I don't think that's going to go too well. Moving on. So um, I'm going to kick things off with just a little bit of background and then um you know if there are any questions Ari is going to jump in and we'll we'll, we'll have yeah. this turn this into more of a conversation more than anything else this is not about um you know powerpoints or death death by powerpoint as as, as it's referred to uh we're hoping that this is more of a conversation and please as Ari mentioned uh you know put in your questions in the chat box and then we'll, we'll go from that so how do we define it? What is lean? Lean, uh, particularly, I mean, you see a lot of definitions out there. If you Google the term lean, you're going to see a whole bunch of definitions. We have one that's probably about uh, 30 or 40 words, and I could um, I could certainly show you that, but I don't want to confuse the matter. And basically, how we describe it is in several ways: a systematic way to maximize value by eliminating waste. What does that mean? Typically, what that means is that if I can eliminate or minimize waste within my processes, wherever they, these processes reside, I can end up doing more with less effort, right? And what that does for me, it frees up my capacity. So if I can do that, right, doing more with less effort, as companies and organizations look at growing their businesses, right, that should really become part of their growth strategy, right? Because, you know, typically looking at uh, lean in terms of tools only, prevents us from incorporating that into our culture. And that's what lean really needs to be. It needs to become part of the organizational DNA for it to work as effectively as you want it to work at, right? Many organizations, and it's it's a really a sad story to, to bring this up, but, but it is, it's the truth. Nine out of 10 of those organizations that pick up the, the lean thinking and methodology as a bunch of tools, they fail at it because they forget that this needs to become part of the fabric of the organization, part of the DNA, part of the culture of the organization. It becomes the driving force for the organization to grow itself and become more competitive and look at waste every day, every hour of the day, 
right? So, and that's hey, what Mateen, this is all about. Yes. Mateen, let me kind of ask you a question about that. Sure. You know, thinking about making it the culture, why, you know, how do people, when people are doing lean and they don't mm -hmm. make it the culture, what does that look like? Like, how do we know if we're doing it wrong? And then right. when you kind of, when you get through that, maybe how do we know when we're doing it right? What are the side markers that say, hey, we're, we're, we're making this part of our DNA and we're not? Right. So uh, I was, that, that reminds me of a client. We were at it, um, we were at this so-called lean deployment or implementation or implementing or deploying some of the lean practices and, and principles into this organization's into this organization and six months into it, I had a three hour, couple hour session, um, uh, you know, just awareness sessions with these, with these individuals. So we brought in a group of roughly 12 people and uh, we were showing them tools, what, what lean tools look like, what it's about to do. And by the way, I said, look, uh, you've been at this for six months. What does lean mean to you so far? Silence, crickets, okay? There was, it was probably one of the worst sessions that I had in terms of awareness. And I'm, I'm looking at myself and saying, what did I do wrong? And I said, okay, maybe I could have done this and that and the other. But then right after it finished, I went to the owner of the company and I said, when I asked this question, there was silence. People had no idea. They, they were not willing to contribute. They were not willing to answer, right? And all of a sudden, the, the you can see the blood pressure, you know, you, you see the owner's face getting red and saying, I've been telling them for six months what lean is. And I said, stop. I don't care if you've told them 20,000 times, it's not working, okay? Their perception is silence. When I ask, what do you think? How do you feel? Has it helped you? It's like pulling teeth. It's like being a dentist, right? It's like, I cannot get any answers from those people. There's no engagement. That is one indication where you know it's not working. The other indication, Ari, would be when you hear a lot of they, right? You hear a lot of they. So how is lean going? How are your process improvement issues? Oh yeah, they came here and they did this and they did that, right? That's an indication that says the actual people, the subject matter experts, the people that work in Gemba, in the real place, that create value are not involved because they're constantly referring to they, right? right? That's an indication as well. Did that you know, you know, it totally yeah. does. You know what it reminds me of too? It's when we talk about sort of a company's mission, a company's vision, mm -hmm. the core values. Mm -hmm. If the core values are only referenced by pointing at the wall or, oh, what are your core values? Well, go, go to the website. I think they're on there somewhere. <laughs> Versus where exactly. we, have to, we have to take action, right, to make them tangible. And, and we have to talk about them, right? If our core values matter, then we should be talking about them. When we're coaching people, we need to be connecting the coaching moments back to our core values. When we're doing 360 reviews or performance reviews, individual one-on-ones, we have to connect those coaching moments back to the core values. And it sounds to me like to make lean real, same thing. When I see something, not about this project or this tool, right. but about the right. concept, why is it so important to drive efficiency? Am I picking up what you're putting down? Absolutely. And what's my role? How do I contribute to it? And, yeah. and when we connect that dots, when we connect, for example, our process improvement initiatives and the lean tools that we use on those initiatives, when we link those initiatives to the company's mission and vision, now you got people's attention. We're not just going through this exercise because we want to use lean tools. And, and this is another thing that comes up in our conversations with clients is, you know, oh yeah, we, you know, lean, oh yeah, we we do 5S, you know, we do five, what does that mean? Yeah, we 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 do five, you know, every Friday we do 5S. I'm like, first of all, you don't do 5S, 5S becomes part of your environment, and it's just a tool, by the way, right? Uh you know, when was the last time, you know, how many, for example, how many uh, uh, suggestions for improvements came from the actual um, uh, subject matter experts? How involved were they in those improvements? And what did the metrics tell you? And do you actually see more smiles and involvement and engagement by your people, right? Are people yeah. interested, right? There's a great example. There's a, there's a video and, you know, it's on YouTube. I mean, you can certainly... Um, check it out. There, there are multiple examples of FASTCAP, F-A-S-T-C-A-P, right? It's a small company out the, in the, the Northwest in Washington State. And um, they have several, the owner has put up several videos on, on YouTube, kind of boasting about his lean initiative and his culture. And it's really refreshing to watch those things and see what some of the examples are where lean is incorporated into that culture. And I've been doing this 
you know, I was brainwashed at, at an early age, you know, <laughs> back when I was, I think I was, I was out of college three years and I had the opportunity to, to work at a Danaher company. It was not knowing at the time that this was the first initiative at Danaher and one of the first initiatives in Connecticut using the Toyota production system. And we had Japanese consultants that came in and they did a nice job of brainwashing me. And it was a good way of brainwashing me because it kind of stayed with me because I never looked at processes the same way. I never looked at cultures the same way. And um, yeah, that's important. Right? So let me ask you this. So yeah. we get, so we, 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 let's, let's, where does this apply? Right. So, so we know we want to, we want our business to be better. We want to right. minimize waste, right. Increase efficiency. So right. like, and I know you sort of mentioned the Toyota system and you want to talk about the history. So maybe right. let's like quickly get through the history and then talk about yeah. where does this apply? Like, let's get, let's get into, let's get into sure. action mode here. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. So, you know, back at World War II, when, you know, Japan was on the losing end and stuff, you know, the Department of War, we call it Department of Defense now, you know, sent people like Deming and Duran and other educators and experts out to Japan. And they started working with companies like Toyota and others that, and they helped them rebuild their manufacturing base, right? At the meantime, company, in the meantime, companies like Toyota and others started to tour facilities worldwide, including uh, Ford Motor Plant and try to understand how Ford operated and they came back with a whole bunch of lessons. But the biggest lesson that I think they learned was one of the biggest lessons was understanding that they don't have the capital. They don't have the resource that Ford has. So they tapped into their most important asset, people. And it's it's interesting because when we look at our, our wastes, Toyota doesn't even consider it eight wastes. We call it eight wastes. Toyota calls it the seven wastes because the, one of the eighth ways that we put in there is non-utilization of resources. Toyota realized early on that if you don't tap into the full potential of your people, their expertise, their creativity, you, you forget it. It's not going to work. So that was the approach that Toyota basically came up with. They, they called it the Toyota production system. You see in the picture, just-in-time manufacturing is one of the pillars. And when companies in in connecticut and other states in the us they started to hear about what toyota was doing especially after the book the machine that changed the world came out kind of talked about toyota's secret sauce people said what is it that the japanese are doing well guess what a lot of it basically originated from deming and others with his plan do check act methodology and other lessons that the, the japanese learned from people like deming right so when i hear and I, heard, I used to hear this back in the 80s and 90s. Oh, this stuff doesn't work here. It's, it's a Japanese thing. Well, guess what? Toyota's biggest facility is in Kentucky, right? They use the Toyota production system, right? One of the biggest successes that of lean in the States was back in the 80s. The NUMI plant, the new United Motor Manufacturing Incorporated plant out in Fremont, California. It is now, unfortunately, when GM went bankrupt, it was picked up by by uh, Tesla, right? But I encourage you and your audience to, if you haven't listened to it, search for this. It's the it's an NPR podcast on Numi, N-U-M-M-I. Listen to that. It's an hour. It tells you the story as to how basically they took the worst General Motors plant in partnership with GM, how Toyota turned the worst GM plant and turned it into GM's best plant. It, it was it was an amazing story, and unfortunately, GM didn't do enough of that across the organization. That's why they they failed, right? In the you know when when the recession hit. But today we know that not only is it used in manufacturing, it's also used in healthcare, in service, and a little bit in government so it's to some extent, right? I wish we had more implementations in the government, but but at least we see it in those examples. So why lead? Why is it important? Continue that discussion. Again, our customers look for value. They demand value, right? And your customers have options from what, you know, most companies anyway, when they have customers, those customers have options. They can go to multiple places. If we look at ourselves as consumers, you know, if we're looking for a product, right? If we go to one place and they don't have it, we move on to another one. Once we've agreed that this is the product that I'm looking for with certain quality, right? All these are given. Who can give it to me with the best price and who can give it to me now? So lead time is important. Quality is important. And obviously cost and prices are important. 
It feels like, honestly, Mateen, on that point, yeah. it feels yeah. like we're getting squeezed everywhere, right? We're just so exactly. used to getting, you know, it's sort of like the, you, you, you sort of made the uh, baby Zoomer uh, comment. You know, I feel like we're, we're sort of living in the prime generation, uh, yeah. not prime as in number one, but prime as in Amazon, Amazon prime. Exactly. It's yeah. like, it feels like everyone's expecting everything. Uh, I think prime used to be two days. Now it feels like half the time it's same or next day. Absolutely. Uh, and that, that kind of pressure to get the thing that we're used to getting at top quality at a tremendous price really quickly is taken over. And it's not just on items, right? It's on, exactly. it's on services, it's on response time, Absolutely. whether you're, whether you're, you know, IT help desk, mm -hmm. whether it's an accounting firm, uh, you know, whether it's a law office, like everything's there. And quite frankly, technology is only increasing this. Uh, and the legal profession, I think is a great example where they just did that AI bot that startup in New York, that's really saying, hey, we've got a computer that can do the majority of this legal doc review for you, which is only gonna to continue to put pressure to find how we can compete on quality uh, delivery and price. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it used to be that if you, had, if you were in a place where you could basically set your own price, and there might be a few out there that they still can, can set their own price, but think about it, cost is really, that demand is driven by the marketplace. It's driven by us because if we don't like the price, we move on to somebody else, right? Yeah. So that's important, right? Speaking yeah, of that, I, uh, yeah, go ahead. Just, you know, it's one thing I, should, I a few years ago, I, we did a, a concept seminar. And mm -hmm. I remember there was a slide that I still remember today. It said mm -hmm. cost plus profit yes. equals price as the exactly. old way of thinking. Exactly. But really now it's price uh, minus cost equals profit. And we have a lot less control over that. We have to focus in on that cost to maximize profit. And that's, I think, frankly, why I've been so excited about this lean office approach, because the only way to manage, there's two ways I view, uh, Mateen, to manage costs, right? One is reduce quality. Yep. You know, and I think to the point, unfortunately, you know, GM and some other car makers had taken, you know, have tried to maintain profitability by reducing right. quality over time and hoping exactly. people didn't notice. Well, guess yeah. what? They, no they noticed. <laughs> um, and, and so the other way to do it, right, is improve delivery efficiency so that we can deliver the same or better quality exactly. more rapidly or more reliably, exactly. you know, at the same or less price. And so leveraging that point. Exactly, exactly. So what, what you mentioned about, you know, cost plus profit equals price, and that's how it used to be. You must have taken some mind reading courses in, in college because <laughs> as I put this up, I said, maybe I should have also included that. But yep. you're right. But in most cases, it's it's the market that sets the price and we don't have a choice. We just have to compete, right? We have to be the best out there to compete. If we don't, somebody else will do it and they'll eat our lunch. That, that's yeah, wild. listen, I, and I, I just I just want to say, uh, one of someone in the audience put in uh, the, the question, which isn't a question, but I think it's a comment worth repeating, even mm -hmm. though it was a little bit ago. Lean only succeeds when the president leads. And exactly. I think and I think like most initiatives, whether it is core values, mission, vision, even that customer centric focus, all that stuff, it has to start uh, from the top down. And I think you hit the nail on the head saying connecting why, why forget what you call it. You could call it lean, call it Kaizen, call it whatever you want. But exactly. if, if you either believe that efficiency and driving efficiency makes your business better or you don't, and it's got to be a top down uh, believe everybody's got to buy in. And, and Ari, I got I got spoiled because, like I said, in the early years of my career, I I saw one of the best examples. And and when I moved on to other companies, I was in shock. And I was I was asking questions: Where's the president? Where's the owner? Where's the yeah. CEO? How come they he or she is not involved in these kaizens or these? You know, they're just basically up there saying, "Oh yeah, we we support this," but they're not in it. And yeah. they need to be in it. They need to be involved. It's not the commitment; it's the involvement. Right, the commitment and the involvement. So that's key. By the way, oh uh, there, was a, there was a knock on the door yesterday by the Amazon driver. Uh, he wanted to. He asked us if we were okay because we hadn't uh, had a delivery in a couple of days. <laughs> Moving on. Um, why lean? Kind of continue our discussion on why why this is important uh, in the office as well. You know, in in different environments, not just on the factory floor. Not not why. You know, uh, we we just don't want to focus it on one area, one particular industry. If you look at your total elapsed time on any process, right? Typically what we see is that 95% of that total elapsed time, that total lead time, from the time that an inquiry comes in to the time that we provide that answer to a customer, to a client, the majority of that time is typically non-value added. 
and I experience this. You know, I I take this stuff. Yeah, you gotta have to give me an example because that seems right. crazy. You know, like that's right. yeah. So this is and this is what it basically boils down to, right? When when we look at this total lead time as this pie, right, as this pie chart, very it's the very uh, smallest piece that you see on this pie chart is is creation of the value. So and typically the majority of that of that total lead time is represented by these eight ways, right? So anytime our process shuts down or, you know, there's a delay involved, right? We experience downtime. Chances are one of these culprits is behind it. So we have to kind of identify where these reside and go after them to eliminate or minimize them. But an example that I experienced a couple of days ago, and uh, unfortunately I take this stuff home, right? So I went to a post office not to be named, and um, I'm standing in line. I arrived at five of four. And, and what I needed was a letter that needed to be certified. And um, so I waited in line. By the way, that was my third trial. I went by the place two other times and I saw the line basically coming out of the building. And I said, you know what? Third time I said, I got to try. I, I got to mail this. I don't have a choice. So I arrived at roughly five of four and I didn't leave until 10 of five. So that total lead time of 55 minutes. I spent what, two minutes, three minutes at the window? So two, three minutes divided by 55 minutes, that that's roughly 5%. So as I'm walking away, even though I'm frustrated, I'm like, you know what, I proved it again. It is true, yeah. right? <laughs> and I, I mean, you know, this is, but, but we experience these things with everyday processes, whether it's the post office or whether it's other interactions that we have, Take the cable company, you call them up and you have a problem. They, you know, you go through 45 minutes, an hour and a half sometimes of torture, and then you finally hang up on them. So when you look at the total lead time, understand from the time that your customer makes contact with you to the time that they receive an answer from you or they receive the service or a product, how long did that truly take? Not so much, it takes us five minutes to enter the inquiry into our system, and prepare the policy takes three hours or whatever, but look at the wait time in between. Look at what the true lead time was that the customer experienced. Yeah, no, I totally. Uh, you know, why do you think, you know, it's harder to apply lean in an office environment? Why hasn't that caught on as much as it has, you know, in, in say, in the on the production floor as much? So in the production floor, office processes are typically well defined, right? When you when you say, okay, we take the material, we basically, uh, you know, when it comes to production, we take this part, we twill, put it into a machine. It, you know, uh, we were looking for certain specs. Once the part comes out of it, it looks exactly to the print that we were looking for or to the design that we had we had developed. It's good to go. We can actually see the beginning and the end of the process. Sometimes in the office, with some of the office processes, they're not as well defined. This scope is not clear. I, I come across this at times when I say, how do you how do you do this task in the office? And I often, you know, not many times, sometimes I hear, oh, we don't have a process. People just do it. So a lot of the times what we experience is what's in their head. And they just go through a process based on tribal knowledge or based on what we've always done. It. And sometimes it's very difficult to kind of put our arms around what the process really is until we actually take the document and say, okay, what happens to it? We become the document and we travel through the process steps and the touch points to understand what happens to this particular document or inquiry or whatever, you know, a quote or an order or whatever it might be. Yep. Oh, I think maybe we lost. Uh, I think maybe we lost uh, Mateen a little bit there. Uh, I want to find. Uh, we went out there to the shop. <laughs> oh, we went hey, to the shop. I think I think we lost you for a second there. Are you back? I'm back. I'm back. I'm oh, back. beautiful. All right. oh, okay, sorry. 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 So we missed you. So you you were on harder to identify customer right. product service and customer value. So right. you know, right. we, you know we, we had talked about the the processes in the office. Right. aren't as really well defined as they are on the on the factory floor. Now we're saying exactly. harder to identify customer. What does that mean? Exactly. So the office processes sometimes either forget or have a tough time understanding who their customer truly is. Okay. I was talking to an engineer and I said to him, I said, look, 
uh, we, we basically went out to the shop floor and we asked the individuals, your customers, by the way, how complete and accurate was the drawing that the, that comes out of engineering? And they said, you know what? 50% of the time, the information is incomplete and accurate. His face got red. He was, he, he, he was, he became so angry at hearing that I said, calm down. This is your customer speaking. You have a process that pr produces an output. That output needs to meet certain criteria for it to be effective. I said, this is your customer speaking. Talk to your, listen to your customer, ask your customer, you know, are they happy with what you're providing them, right? So in that example, they didn't even realize that the shop floor employees were one of the customers of engineering. So that's an example, yeah. right? And that happens all the time internally too, right? Exactly. Like not even just, you know, it's it's between purchasing, it's between IT, it's between, you know, whatever. You know, there there's a lot of internal customers and exactly. we don't always think of it that way, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And and here's another one that we typically see. Oh. Waste is typically harder to see my, in, a, in an office. This is my this is this is my favorite one. <laughs> uh, I'm, I want to let you talk on it, but boy, I want to jump in. Go ahead. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, you got an engineer that's basically sitting there behind a, a CAD, AutoCAD, you know, SolidWorks, whatever the software is, and they're designing the product, right? I mean, what kind of waste is in there? They're designing, they're doing their job. You got somebody entering an order, right? I mean, what possible waste could we have within that process? They're working, right? Until we actually start looking into those processes and we notice, for example, that the engineer, before they start designing, they waste probably a half hour looking for information. And half hour, I'm being kind, half hour is probably on the low end, right? Yeah. So just to get started, just to get started about with the design process, they have to spend a half hour fishing for information, right? And it comes in different formats, Excel, email, let me open this binder, open this drawer, so on and so forth. Order entry, they might have to jump through 15 screens and 200 clicks to, to finish an order that, to, that needs to be entered. So we're not gonna see these ways until we actually dive in within those processes and get a feel for what actually happens. Again, going back to my earlier point, become the order become the pretend you're the inquiry you're the customer inquiry and see what happens to you how many processes you go through how long you sit and wait for someone to get back to you on an approval or a question right yeah pretend listen you're it <laughs> you, you know i'm passionate on this point and i think that uh you know i want to keep the 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 thing moving forward because i want to yeah. get this thing flipped over to action but i just right. it just it merits saying that the the problem we really have is that when you're on the floor and you see the actual wasted parts right when you have when you have wasted parts coming off when you see extra scrap there's right. a tangible piece of that not only do you see it on the ground but someone's got to pay to remove it someone's right. got to get it picked up you got to buy more you got to buy more bar stock or buy more whatever resin whatever the thing is so it's it's a bit more tangible both in real world you can touch it and it shows up on the PL but somehow when people are taking more time right. over time, somehow we convince ourselves that's yeah. the only way it can be done. Exactly. And we don't go there. And the order entry, I think is a, is a perfect one. How many, you know, we, we, you know, the sale to get from the customer tells, tells your sales or marketing person, or maybe in a law firm or an accounting firm, it tells the partner, they want to do a project with you right. or they right. want to do an engagement. Right. What are the steps it takes to get from that engagement to them actually getting value from you and how much of that is codified and how much of it relies on someone telling someone something else. Um, and if we forget to tell them something, yeah. we get that loop back, right? And then God oh, forbid, yeah. we don't tell them, they run down the road, we're gonna, we're gonna peer review the output, that's our process. We yeah. go to peer review and we realize, oh shit, they did yeah. this whole thing wrong. So <laughs> you gotta redo this quarter of the report. That right. somehow doesn't show up somewhere uh, I'm, I just, I think, I think the waste is there. And the challenge I think is that in, in a lot of times in the office, we have to believe it's there first and go find it before we're justified. Whereas on the factory floor, it smacks us in the face, even if we're not looking for it. And, and here's the other thing, Ari, here's the other thing. And we'll move on. Here's the other thing. It's easier to capture waste in the, in the factory floor uh, on the factory floor, because we, we can walk by a pile of scrap and say, that costs me X amount of dollars, right? In the office, when we see the back and forth, 
you know, between, okay, I don't have all the information. Let me call the customer back or let me go ask Larry. You know, he, he does the invoicing. Let me go ask somebody, right? Uh, they A, consider it, oh, it's part of my job to do that. And I have to convince our clients. No, it should. Yeah, okay, it's part of your job, but it shouldn't be, right? right. You need to have a better process. It should not be part of your job, right? That's one. The other thing is we bury these wastes and these costs on their overhead. Yep. We just say, okay, that's overhead. So what? You know, who cares? Right. Yep. But the cost is there. These are indirect costs, indirect costs that exist. But and let really, me right, go ahead. I just want to say one thing, because I think yeah. it goes back to what we're talking about before. Right. And what ends up happening when you bury it into overhead is right. it goes back to this thing. Right. You can only get the cost down on your product by either improving efficiency. Right. Or reducing quality. Exactly. And what we end up doing is we go back to overhead and we say we can't have this much overhead. <laughs> Find a way to cut overhead. And what do we do? We hire younger, more junior people. We yep. try and drive down those costs, which right. reduces the quality to our internal customer. And As that well may look sure. good on yep. a P&L or an income yep. sheet or a profit statement right. this year, next year. But eventually, we're hollowing out that value. And what right. ultimately happens is when we start driving less quality to our internal customer, inevitably, less quality goes to our external customer. And we get down to that sort of into the spiral of death. Um, exactly. which maybe we'll talk about in these paradigms. So, no, sorry. no, no, that's fine. Ahead, I mean, no, 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 that's, that's a great point. That's a great point. And, and, you know, a lot of times at the center of it is basically the paradigms, you know, the paradigms that, you know, we're unique. This doesn't apply to us. You and I have talked about this before. One of the things that I don't do, I don't call it lean manufacturing because as soon as you add the last name to lean, oh, it's manufacturing. It's, you know, it's the factory floor. It's the, it's the welding and the, and the milling and the this and that and the other. No, it's, if you have processes, chances are there's opportunity within those processes. And we've seen this time and time again. But one of the first things we got to do is we got to stop these paradigms that we're unique. This doesn't apply to us. We tried that before it didn't work. They won't let us do it. You know, here's here we go with the they. Happen to be the busiest people in the state of Connecticut. I've never met they, but every time we try to implement something, they come into the play. You know, it, it's, it's ridiculous. It's like, stop step back, become a two-year-old, and start asking why, why, why? Why do we do this, right? Why do we do this? So when we break those paradigms, it helps us to move forward. And, you know, there are many examples. You and I have talked about this before. You know, here's an example from Western Union, right? The telephone comes up, and this is in 1876. This is a statement they make because, again, their paradigm is that in order for us to communicate forever, you know, we have to send telegrams. What is this telephone thing that's coming out, right? That's not going to work, right? So think about these paradigms, challenge yourself, find the paradigms that you have within your own organization, try to break those. Western Union is a great example. There's a video from the early 2000s. They looked at their process related to when a, an agent, potential agent, or a person wants to become an agent of Western Union, they put an application in. In their current state, it took roughly 19 days for this application to be processed. They looked at their processes in detail. They noticed lots of back and forth, lots of piles of paper that wasn't going anywhere, lots of waiting in between, incomplete and accurate information, lots of approvals, so on and so forth. They brought it down to a day. So it is doable, but the first thing we gotta do is stop saying we're unique and take a walk out there, make observations and see what's happening. No, I, I think this is great because I want to get into the action. And I'm, I, you know, uh, I, I love this idea, go to Gemba. And I think, right. you know, for people that are on the, on, the, on the webinar who are in manufacturing, maybe have kind of heard mm -hmm. of this concept before. But for, for people who aren't or, or don't know what, what go to Gemba is, you know, what does that mean? And why is going to the Gemba so important <clears throat> when you're looking to get started on driving efficiency in, uh, in your business? Exactly. So we want to go where value is created, right? It, you know, one of the worst things that I see happen from at times, and this still happens, is trying to solve a problem around the conference room table, right? We get together and we hear there's a problem. So we get the, the key people in the organization and we come into a very comfortable, posh conference room. And, you know, there's, you know, then the discussion goes on forever. And then we walk out of there with a potential solution. OK, so what we got to do is do this. Well, guess what? We never really defined the problem. You know, we, we have this assumption that we know what the problem is. We cannot truly understand the extent of the problem until we actually go and spend some time in the trenches, right? And 
truly understand what the workers, what the people that actually create that value are going for, going through. So go out there, see what's going on, ask questions, make observations, get people's input. You know, this is get involved in that problem solving by asking questions. You get a better understanding of what the true issues are. And it could be a simple question like, what actually prevent you from establishing a perfect uninterrupted information flow when you get this document when you get this request when you get this inquiry coming in what are some of the challenges that you experience do you ever have to stop to go back and ask a question when you receive that incoming information how complete and accurate is the information coming to you and they're going to say well i don't know it depends it, it varies give me a ballpark what do you think is it 80 percent of the time and they say no no i wish it's more like 40%, you know, four out of ten, six out of uh, 10 times, I got to go back, either call the customer or call somebody internally and say, I don't get this. They're missing a quantity. They're missing a due date. They're missing this and that and the other. So by truly going out there into where the action takes place, we have a better understanding of what the problem is, what the current state looks like, and then we can take appropriate action. So let me let me just stop you for a second here because I've got a few different questions. So I mean sure. I think number one, what what you're saying right off the bat makes a ton of sense to me, right? When we when we want to figure out how to solve a problem, and frankly, when we even want to start by identifying the problem, mm -hmm. the best thing to go is go where the action is. Yep. Go to the people that are doing the work and just see what's happening. You know, and I feel like when you go and see what people are doing, we can kind of emotionally connect to wow. When I want to get this done, first Ari has to call Mateen, Mateen has to call Kathleen, Kathleen right. has to call Cindy, Cindy right. calls Mateen back, then Mateen circles all the data back together, goes back to Ari, Ari goes back and double checks with Kathleen, right? <laughs> when you see people, ha when you see it happening, we can connect to it emotionally, Absolutely. which I think helps us get more excited about solving the problem and going back to what we said before, kind of being committed to it, making it part of what you want to do is, is a huge part of it. Well, let me ask you the, kind of this question. Sure. Sure. Let's say I want to get started. I'm saying, listen, I'd love to add more efficiency to my organization, but I can't I can't monitor every single process, right? Certainly, mm -hmm. certainly even a little bit harder sometimes in, in COVID, especially when you're an office worker. How do you figure out, Mateen, how do I sit down and go, where should I look first? Right. Which part of the action do I want to get into first? How would I how would I think about that? So every organization, every company has uh, certain goals and objectives, right? So if we want to, for example, um, you know, return an answer to our customer in a relatively short period of time, right? Let's let's take quoting, for example, right? Let's say the company says, you know, our objective within the next year or two or three or five years is to grow our market share by 20%, 30% or double it or whatever, whatever that objective is, right? What are some of those key processes that directly link to our goals as a company? You know, that directly link to our mission, right? To directly to where we want to be when we grow up in a sense, right? So how robust are those processes, right? And that's one way. Another way is to just ask questions, right? So in the in the quoting example, you know, if if our quoting lead time, for example, is 10 days, and one of our goals is to double our market share, good luck with that. You know, if it takes you 10 days to turn a quote around, you know, let maybe we it's time that we spend some time understanding what happens with a request for a quote and how long it takes to go from start to finish and deliver an answer to a customer. You know, if it takes more than a day or two, that customer is long gone. So, you know, how are we going to accomplish our goal of uh, gaining more customers that way? That we, we certainly, you know, have something against us right off the bat. But another example would be, another way would be to actually talk to people, talk to the people um, that, you know, perform those tasks and gain an understanding of, you know, where the biggest opportunities are. Right. That's that's the two ways that I can think of right off the bat. I, I, I love that concept. I mean, I think one thing and you tell me what you think about this. Mo a lot of us know who we think our top performers are. Yeah. And one thing is to go to those top performers and ask the question you have there. Right. What's right. preventing you from achieving your smoothest, most interrupted workflow? You know, right. said a different way. What's preventing you from being the best you at work that you can be? And frankly, we might find out that some of this is is personality stuff and some of it's process based and if we can find if we go to our top performers and find get their input on how to make their lives better seems exactly. to me we might find a lot of wood to chop there to make everybody a little bit better <laughs> absolutely you just reminded me of a uh, 
of a Sesame Street character called Ernie. And uh, I'll, you know, th this will hopefully make more sense as, as, as I explain it. Uh, I started working at this particular company years ago. And as part of my orientation, as part of my training, <coughs> excuse me, I was um, asked to go talk to Ernie. And um, Ernie was the lead in this particular department. And this was, this was right on the shop floor. And they told me, warned me, they said, when you talk to Ernie, just keep in mind, he's a bit of a complainer. You know, he's always uh, annoyed with something. He's always complaining about something. So here, here I am, new guy going in there and say, hey, my name is so-and-so. And he's like, uh, he called me Martine right off the bat. You know, most people do that. They, they, you know, like I don't have enough letters in my full <laughs> name. So they throw another, another letter in there. Yes, Martine, nice to meet you. And I said, okay, it's Martine, but you know, hopefully you'll learn that as we go through. And we started talking a little bit. I said, can you show me how this process works? And, and you know, he was kind of reluctant at the beginning. And then I started digging a little bit more. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And, and then he started opening up a little. And he said, you know what? Uh, two weeks ago, I asked for a for an hammer, you know, that I needed to do my job. I, don't, I forget if it was a hammer, hammer or a screwdriver or a tool, just a hand tool. And, you know, I'm still waiting. I said, oh, okay, that's interesting. When I got back to my desk, I placed an order for the tool that he needed came back either the following day or two days later, now I had Ernie. Ernie started to open up. Ernie mm. was had so many improvement ideas to make the processes better. It was amazing. All I had to do was to prove to him that I was listening. So yeah. when when we go out there, we don't want to just go out there and just, you know, you know, go through the motions and say, oh yeah, I hear you. Oh yeah, well, well let me make a list of the stuff we're going to solve for you. And then nothing happens. That is yeah. even worse. If that's the approach we want to take, don't do it. Don't go to jail. Yeah. No, <laughs> right. uh, yeah, don't, yeah. Yeah. Uh, listen, I think it's great. Please, please keep throwing some uh, questions in there. One of the things that came up, and, and I know we got a, a little bit here, but I think we're you know getting towards the end and can answer some questions. Right. Sure. I think the most important thing is to get started. And, and one thing I just wanted to throw out there is sure. I tend to see people with a lot of things focus on the tools mm -hmm. and less on the results, right? It's not Right. You know, I know we, we sort of touched on 5S earlier. What yeah. is 5S? How do I get 5S in there? Or or how do I do different stuff? I think a lot of times we, we see that come out. And what you just talked about, and I think what's yeah. so important about go to Gemba, go to where the action is, right. talk to people, get the ideas there, right. um, is that is is that that's going to help us determine what we really need to do. And exactly. when you want to when you want to build a house, you don't start by figuring out what hammer you need to have. You start figuring out what do you need the house to look like? How many people need to live there? Exactly. What are you trying to accomplish in the house? And then you worry about how many hammers and how many nails. If you start with the tools, I think we're, we're you know, you know we're, we're, we're putting the car, car before the horse. Can you do me a favor? Someone asked a question, and I think this is really important. Sure. How do you think we should think about addressing the naysayers? The, the, the you know, the salty dogs who just, you know, this is never going to work. Oh, here we yep. go. Another initiative. You talk about that? Yep. Uh, Ernie, Ernie was a naysayer, by the way. Ernie was a naysayer. He was, he was one of those examples. Another one that I ran into was a person that was just basically shrugging this off saying, you know, this is the program of the month and all that. It's, gonna, it's the flavor of the month. It's going to go away. You're going to bring them on board when they see, when they start seeing simple examples and accomplishments and how those improvements make their job easier. You have to define what's in it for them, right? The with them. What's in it for me, right? You want mm -hmm. me to try this. What's in it for me? I don't want you to just say that we're going to end up with happiness and prosperity and happiness for all and liberty for. The, don't know. Spe specifically, what is this going to do for me? If we just tell it's going to grow our market share, they're still not going to be able to relate to it. So pick something that they can relate to and show them that how applying a lean tool, a lean solution can help them do their job in five minutes rather than 25 minutes and three days of waiting. As soon as we start proving to them that these improvements, these simple solutions, and we don't have to start big, we have to start somewhere. The example I gave you with Ernie was, you know, that hand tool that I gave him made his job easier. So now I can have a broader discussion in terms of what other improvements we can put in place. So you have to define the with them. I do. I love it. Yeah, we we talk about this. Everyone's listening to this same radio station, W I I F M. Uh, you know what's in it for me. And I and I think what's great about the office, uh, just really quickly, and why I'm so excited about this is, there's when you go to something where we haven't applied lean mm -hmm. historically before, and mm -hmm. when you start, 
there's so much low hanging fruit. There's so many examples of the about the, the the webcam. You know, working remotely right now. How many times do you, you talk to somebody and they're using two screens, their laptop down here oh, and yeah. their computer up here. And whenever you talk to them, you're talking to the side of their face and they're yeah. awkwardly uncomfortable. And you know what? A $49 webcam on top of their screen would make their life, you know, a lot better. Uh, exactly. or, or sometimes it's really, uh, you know, or sometimes it's really just about like the wires and a cordless mouse. You know, the same, like the tool of the day can really make, uh, a, you know, a, a big difference. And that that can really bring people along. There's a question that kind of came up that I think is sure. really interesting. And I don't know if you have an answer to it, but I, it's something I'm interested to talk about. And we touched on it a little bit, which is in the office, especially during this, the pandemic, so mm -hmm. many people are home. How mm -hmm. have you thought about how can we go to the, how can we go where the action is? How can we monitor? How can we go to Gemba? You know, the, the sort of, you know, the management by walking around. Yeah. How do we do that? you know, in, in today's day and age. So I can actually, I, I don't know if uh, uh, they're on, uh, they're actually joining us today, but I know they registered. But one of the one of the earlier projects that we did during the pan, uh, pandemic was basically uh, through uh, the use of technology. So they were looking at improving a process and they wanted to use different stakeholders, engage different stakeholders in understanding where the opportunities are and how they could, as a team, improve their process. So a lot of that interaction took uh, took place through videos that were sent back and forth uh, and basically studying those videos together or independently and then regrouping and say okay here are my observations right so the persons that are in gemba right they can they provided the video and then the team as a group could basically go through that activity and gain an understanding of what truly happens in gemba right so one of the best examples of camp going to gemba is apollo 13. When Lieutenant Dan shows up, what's his name? Sinise, right? He yep. shows up and, and he goes into a simulator and he says, give me exactly what they've got up there. They cannot go to Gemba. It's not like they can hop on another, you know, uh, <laughs> spaceship. Go, spaceship yes, sir, right. there. So let me fix this for you. So they have to simulate. So what I tell people is be creative in trying to simulate what Gemba is, right? Sometimes the, the use of video technology is helpful. And sometimes you may have to get become even more creative, but that's an example of how we've done it. Yeah, I think so too. And I, you know, I think the other piece too is when you're trying to get started, go to the place where there's likely the most wood to chop. So right. you know, if, if you're if you're if you're a law firm and you're in family law, and the thing you do most is like divorce proceedings, but right. you also occasionally do real estate transactions. Right. I wouldn't start in the real estate transaction area. I might go to right. like you know there. And and so one of the things like you know we think about for example, is, you know, to answer this specific question is go to the thing you do the most. Right. And, and then find someone in there who you trust and feel like is a good performer and exactly. then do an interview. It doesn't, exactly. we don't need to make this super complicated. You right. know, what's the thing you do the most? Let's talk through. And quite honestly, you know, before we even need to engage, you know, a lean practitioner, I right. feel like through the interview process, especially business leaders, we will be shocked to find out how many turnbacks, turnarounds, recommunications, undos, Absolutely. redos that exist. And once we kind of get that list and see where it is, then at that point, I think it's appropriate to sort of go back and maybe engage, you know, somebody like yourself or, or, or somebody who can help, you know, this lean office practitioner to say, here's what, here's what we'd like. Here's right. what we have. Right. Now it's the, we, we know what we, the house looks like today. We know what the house wants to look like. Help me make this into that. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Let me give you an example while you mentioned real estate. So we actually worked with a real estate uh, uh, organization, services organization. You know, they do uh, uh, closings, they do title insurance, so on and so forth. So they have attorneys on board and they have other individuals that basically uh, process information and, and play key roles in information flow. And they looked at their claims process. The goal of the organization is to, and they have, they have grown significantly in the past five, 10 years, and they continue to grow. So the logic was, as we grow, as we develop more policies, that may turn into, not may, but potentially could turn into increased number of claims. So how robust is our claims process? So when we looked at the claims process, and I was working with a with an actual, uh, with a rock star. I mean, this, this guy is unbelievable. He's a jack of all trades. Uh, I love working with him because he's just, so, he has such a mindset for continuous improvement, always asking and challenging the status quo and acting on it. 
uh, when we looked at that process, the total lead time wasn't earth shattering. It was two days and change. It wasn't really huge. But after the improvement, it was cut down to one day and change, right? That helps. Now, here's the, here's the, here's the highlight of the process. We went from something like 28 process steps down to 11 process steps, right? Along the path, the process became more, um, less dependent on paperwork. So we were cutting down less trees. So there were some uh, additional uh, improvement cost, cost savings based on the use of paper, for example. But it made everyone's job easier. And that's the what's in it for me. At the end of the day, when you talk to the stakeholders, they said this was worth it. The process mm -hmm. is actually better, right? hundred percent. And, yep. uh, you know, I think I think what I'm hoping people get out of this and we're running out of time here. So if you have any questions, you know, throw it up there. Um, but I think the 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 really the most important thing, whether when you're talking about office work, whether it's back office at a manufacturer, whether you're a service based business. So it is the front of the house or whatever, if you if you will. Yeah, it is a business imperative to find a way to drive the most efficiency not only because it helps the bottom line, not only because it helps the customer, but because it's gonna make our employees happier and Absolutely. more engaged. And Absolutely. I think going all the way back to the total Toyota production system that you talked about, right. we talk about all the time in business now, how important people are. Culture right. in the office has become talked about left, right, and center. And I think sometimes we forget culture isn't about ping pong tables and kegerators <laughs> um, and all that stuff. No, listen, it's not. And I think, and I think uh, those things are nice, you know. Uh, we have a kegerator in the office. I don't hate it, but 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 the thing is, especially when you're in a when you're less in the office, those things don't even have any material value. Exactly. But you know what does have? Well, you know what does have an enduring value is coming to work every day, feeling right. like you're part of something bigger than yourself, and that right. you're making a difference. And if we can put these lean practices into place in the office, not only are we going to be more efficient, not only are we going to help our customers be better, but we're going to help our employees feel better. Uh, be more engaged, which can only, you know, help all of our businesses uh, be a lot more successful. I think overall, we need to establish better visibility, right? Have Be more visible into our process, in our processes and ask questions, right? And set up processes that are focused on the customer because if we focus on the customer and if they are robust processes and have less waste in them, you're absolutely right. Then the employees are happier, right? And, and it makes for a better day. People actually want to come to work and perform those tests. Let me give you a couple of examples when we walked the process and we identified a couple of interesting, we had a couple of interesting discoveries. Um, we went into account, accounts payable at one particular client. And as we were going through the process and making observations and going from one desk to another, we came across a stash of invoices. These were invoices that were sent in by the company's suppliers and they obviously they want to get paid some of them were as old as two months so these things were buried right now we can say and and the comment is typically oh yeah we know exactly where these things are well if we know exactly where these things are how can you how can we justify invoices piled up for a couple of months and they're not moving and the, and the vendor is, is like where's my money right i need to get paid another example that was that was kind of interesting and and well, I, I can laugh about it now, but we were at a client where, where um, they were, as part of their order fulfillment process, when it came to exports, they had to fill out this particular form and it had to be notarized. So, you know, this was the first time that I had come across uh, such a requirement. So I said, notarize? I said, yeah, absolutely. So I said, how do you do this? They said, well, we go to, um, we used to go to Mary and uh, who's downstairs, who was downstairs. Uh, Mary quit two years ago. Um, but we would go downstairs and basically ask her to notarize it. She was notary public, so she could notarize it for us. I said, oh, great. Uh, what do you do now? Well, you know, we, we basically uh, batch uh, the paperwork that, that needs notarization, you know, needs to be notarized, and we go to our local bank. I said, oh, interesting. So you actually drive there? I said, yeah, we actually drive there. When we started digging and asking questions as to why the heck do we do this, that requirement had stopped five years earlier. So for five years, they were actually still going through the process, two of which they would walk downstairs, come, you know, whatever. But for three years, they would go to the bank. That's, listen, I think that's a great example. Listen, we got to wrap it. Thanks, everyone, for attending. I do want to say one thing, uh, you know, uh, uh, Paul Murphy, who's, thank you, Paul, been very active in the Q&A. He brought up one point, which I think is an important one, which is, 
too often people lean out a process only to realize they've improved a waste or non-value add process. Yep. And I think that's where uh, that's where having a lean practitioner is helpful, right? You get the interview, you understand what you want to get to, but having someone help to make sure we don't spend a lot of time to get rid of something that didn't wasn't a value add to begin with, or or we we lean out the wrong piece that doesn't really add value that's a very um, good point. is critical. Yep. The most important thing, I'll just leave it on this, Mateen, I'll let you close it out, is we got to get started. It is a business imperative. The first thing we need to do after we've realized we have to do something is to start. And let's get out there, get where the action is, interview the people that know uh, so we can find out how to make our businesses better. Um, and together we'll do more and succeed. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think I think you said it and that's a good way to wrap it up. I mean, it, you know, when you go out there, busy doesn't necessarily mean productive. So dig into, talk to people, dig into those processes, understand what they're dealing with. Don't, you know, don't just provide lip service. I mean, when you go out there and you listen to these things and you hear people complain about those issues, you know, if you, even if you take one of those, it could be the simplest thing that you take action on. Now you've got that momentum going, right? It, Google this, it's available. Just, you know, I think it's, it's up to 20 million or whatever it was, but t just, just do this search when we're done here. The search is how many, um, how many suggestions um, have actually been provided and implemented, suggestions for process improvement at Toyota since they put in their process improvement platform. So just, just Google that when we're done here and it's amazing as to what they have accomplished. Now, we're not Toyota, we're all different companies, different size organizations, but we don't have to generate X number of improvements, but as we make them, make it continuous, don't stop, right? Start Begin with one, journey. baby. Start, Start with, with one. one. Exactly. Start somewhere. Thank, Absolutely. Thank you, Mateen. Appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Uh, I'm passionate about it. This was fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, certainly, we'll make this available. Have a great day. Make make today make today better than yesterday, and tomorrow better than today. There you go. Thank you all. <laughs>